Our first lesson is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. Talking to his disciples after he had been speaking with the Pharisees, he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we don't have any bread? And when Jesus knew it, he said to them, Why do you reason thus? Because you have no bread. Do you not perceive yet? Do you not understand yet? Has your heart still been hardened? Having eyes, can you not see? And having ears, can you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke bread, the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said, 12. And then when among the 7,000, among, among the 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up then? And they said, seven. He said to them, how is it that you don't understand? Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him, and they begged him that he might touch the blind man. He took the blind man by the hand. He led him out of town, and when he had spit in his eyes, he put his hands on him and asked him what he saw. And he looked up, and he said, I see men as trees walking. And Jesus put his hands upon him again and said, look up. And he was restored. And the man saw very clearly. And then he sent him away to his house saying, do not go back into town and do not tell anyone in town. And then Jesus went out with his disciples and he asked his disciples, he said to them, who do people say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others, that you're one of the prophets. But he said to them, but you, who do you say I am? Peter answered and said unto him, thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man about him. Amen. Our final lesson is on the back of the Purple Order of Service Sheets, if you'd like to follow along. Jesus said to his disciples, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's the reference from Matthew I was reading out of Mark. This is the truth upon which the Lord builds his church. Peter there represents that truth. Swedenborg says, I once spoke with the Babylon nation in the spiritual world concerning the keys that were given to Peter, whether they believed that authority over heaven and hell was transferred by the Lord to them. Which, as the ones who were the head of their religion were speaking with me, they vehemently insisted upon this, saying that there was no doubt about it because it is manifestly said. But to the inquiry, whether they knew that in everything of the word there is a spiritual sense, which is the sense of the word in heaven, they said at first that they did not know it. But afterwards they said they would inquire. And when they, they inquired, they were instructed that there is a spiritual sense to everything written in the word. They were informed at length that for Peter in the word, the truth of the church from good is meant, and the same by the rock. And as all good and all truth are from the Lord, and nothing from man, mankind, all authority belongs to the Lord. On hearing this, they became indignant. 
they said they wished to know whether there was a spiritual sense in these words. Whereupon the word which is in heaven was given to them. And when they read it, they saw manifestly that Peter was not even mentioned there, but instead of him, quote, truth from good which is from the Lord. On seeing this, they rejected it from anger. And they would have torn it to pieces with their teeth. Unless at that moment, it had been taken away from them. They were thence convinced, although they were not willing to be convinced, that the Lord alone, excuse me, that to the Lord alone, that authority belongs, and not the least bit to any man, because it is divine authority. This sermon is entitled, Here's All You Need to Know About... Is that the way Jesus spoke to his disciples? Can you think of a passage in the Word where Jesus says, All you need to know is... And and we know from reading the Word that if if there was just like one thing, all you need to know, we'd have one page of one book, and that would be it. Here's all you need to know. Although a few places in the Word, the Lord comes pretty close to that. And one of those places is here in the Gospel of Mark. The Lord's been talking to the disciples about what they're hearing going on around them. What, what, do, you, what, what do people say? What, 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 are we, what are we influenced by? And, and today in this world, more than ever, we have lots of things that we hear about going on all the time. If you are on the internet once in a while, you'll see a little thing on the side saying, all you need to know about the war in Ukraine. All you need to know about spinach. Or, it's, it's a hook. It's, it's, a, it's a way that you're, you're, you're netted. And of course, we know that people follow what we like and click on, so they know to give us more things to click on, to open up you know, other things that let us know what the next thing is. It's wonderful when you watch how the Lord is working with his disciples. He's constantly seeing, quote unquote, what their clickbait is. What are they hooked by? What are they interested in? What gets their attention? And then he answers. So the beginning of the lesson is talking about the Lord with uh, the disciples And they've been visiting or approached and challenged by the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are always expecting a good argument from the Lord because they're filled with good arguments. They've just got, they figured out the world of argument. They're lawyers of Scripture. They're lawyers of the law of the Old Testament. And they loved they loved asking the Lord questions because they figured it would it would they'd get into a fight, they'd tangle him up somehow. And, and, and they'd win. I have a quote here. I'm not sure how well you can read it from, the, uh, from anywhere, but uh, I'll put it up here anyway. I'll try to hold it steady. Truth, it says, doesn't mind being questioned. The Lord never said, oh, don't, no, 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 no not that question. The, the Lord never minded being questioned. It says, a lie, on the other hand, does not like being challenged. And you can think of several places in the Word where, where this, after, after this saying comes, comes very clearly. Um, when, when John the Baptist was killed, the, the Lord, they, they said to the Lord, John the Baptist has been killed. And, and the Lord talks a little bit about John the Baptist. And he, he, he realized that John the Baptist came to give the truth about repentance And they said, he's a worthless man. He's, he's, you know, look at how he dresses. And I've come to give the joy of being the bridegroom. I'm I'm the, you know, I'm here to give you beautiful things. And you say, I'm a a drinker. I'm a wine-bibber. The Pharisees would, would ask Jesus questions. He would answer, but they always found an argument. And when they were asked, well, so it was was what John said from man or from God? And the Pharisees thought, hmm, if we say it's from 
man, then all the people are going to go, well, what? We all know he was from God. Hmm. And if we say he's from God, then, then, um, then he's going to say to us, well, then why didn't you follow him? So they, they kind of huddle together and figure it out. Okay, we've got to tell a lie because we don't believe in John. They didn't like being challenged. So they just said, well, what do you say? <laughs> Similarly, we, we follow with uh, the way people like to get hooked. And we're, we're in Bethsaida, which is, got to get my illustration here. Bethsaida is a town, the house of nets. That's what Bethsaida means. The house, Bethsaida, nets. So, you can tell this is a great net. You could put stuff in it. You could catch fish in it. Maybe. But it, give you the idea of what a net would be like. This was pretty much, I mean, you all know, this is pretty much the kind of netting that would be used, spread out over a broad area, let sink, and then fish would come, and then you pull it up and you catch fish. When I was a child, the mayor of Honesdale, Pennsylvania, would come to our little town, Little hamlet, Honesdale, would come up to Fallsdale and he'd throw a net over to get minnows to go fishing. And we'd love going out to visit with him. He had this big net, dropped it down. We got to put crumbs in the net. The little minnows would come and then he'd go catch big fish. But he used the net to catch minnows. Bethsaida is the house of nets. It's on the seashore, the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, a big lake. And Jesus was in that area when... The Pharisees challenged him. And he turned then to his disciples. He said, you know, watch how they challenge you. Watch how they try to hook you. How they try to capture you. Beware of the leaven, which is the thing that makes bread nice. Beware of what they're telling you that you're going to be hooked into, that you like. You'll be, you'll be snagged. And beware of the leaven of Herod. Now, Herod there wasn't the same Herod that went after Jesus when he was a baby. It was a different Herod. But he's also the ruler in that same area. Beware of Herod. So, beware of the legal, the, uh, legal authorities of the church. Beware of the legal authorities of the area. Watch out. Be careful. They're going to snag you. Now, the disciples, of course, this is all they needed to know. Right? Now, all you need to know. Beware of the leaven of the, the Pharisees, right? So then they're getting on a boat and they start talking to each other. <laughs> what do they come up with? He said that because we didn't bring any bread. Wait, we forgot to get some bread. We just got into the boat. We're in trouble now. Jesus is, he's going to be upset with us that we didn't think about getting any bread. The Lord knows exactly what they're thinking because he's God. And he, you, you got to just think how patient the Lord was. <laughs> how patient. He comes to them and said, don't you remember? Do you, do you not perceive? Do you not know? Can't you, can't, you, can't you understand what this is all about? What we're doing here? It's not about the bread. Don't you remember feeding the 5,000? How many baskets of fragments did we pick up after that? Twelve? And when we fed 4,000, how many fragments did we have left over? Seven? And you're worried about whether you picked up enough bread on the way home from the grocery store? Well, on the way into the boat to go out onto the Sea of Galilee? Later on, Jesus would say to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread from heaven. And when we commune with the Lord in Holy Supper, we say, this is my bread. Take, eat. This is my body. The Lord always has enough for us. So, the house of nets, the house of being hooked or being snagged, is filled with these anxieties, filled with worry. And the Lord constantly comes and says, I'll take care of you. I'll take care. Don't worry whether you have enough to eat. 
Consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air. The Lord takes care of all of them. Here's all you need to know about salvation. Did the Lord give us that kind of an answer? Well, we're going to go a little bit more into this story. Because at the very end, Peter says, you are the Christ. And the Lord says, okay, don't tell anyone. One of the most interesting phrases throughout the New Testament, various places the Lord says, okay, don't say. Don't say. After the bread and the Pharisee thing with this part of the chapter, <clears throat> the Lord is, is then coming to a town. He's coming to, back from uh, being in the ship and he's at Bethsaida. He's been in that area teaching about bread and the Pharisees and their leaven. Watch out, don't get snagged. And they come to the town and a blind man is brought to him. This is an unusual story. Jesus carefully takes him by the hand and leads him out of the city of snags, the city of the interwoven falsities, the, the ideas that are like captivating the mind. And of Bethsaida, he, he had said of three cities, Sherazon, Bethsaida, um, and um, the other big city up there, Capernaum, he said, woe unto you. It would be better off for Tyre and Sidon. It'd be better off for Sod Sodom and Gomorrah than it's going to be for you because you had me with you and you rejected me. And this was one of the cities that he said, whoa, you, you rejected me. So he took this man, this blind man, out of those ways of thinking, those ways of thinking, that, uh, ideas that, that rejected the Lord outside the city. And then... He spat in his eyes. Now, spitting virtually always in the Word or any other place is, is sort of a nasty thing. There was a law that if, if a man uh, died without producing seed, without producing issue for, for his family, for Israel, then the man's younger brother or older brother was supposed to go in with the wife to continue the family line. And if he refused to, the woman was supposed to come in front of all the elders, take off the man's shoe, spit in his face, and say, you're the one who had your shoe taken off. Okay, that, that's just like saying, oh, I could think of a number of different things, but you got caught with your pants down, right? You, you, you didn't do the right thing. Your shoes are off. You didn't do the right thing by me, she's saying, and she spits in his face. That was just one of those rituals, and it really clearly... In the, <laughs> the writing says, and that law has been abrogated. Um, yeah, a number of aspects of that. And we know that when Jesus was crucified, they, they spat on him. But this is something to get us to think about Jesus and his saliva. Jesus and his mouth. And what comes from him. What's his goodness. A couple different places where we hear about the Lord and that sort of thing. We, we know the Lord sweat. He sweat like blood in Gethsemane when he was praying in, in, in the, uh, the garden. And we know that it says that, that the, Lord, the Lord cried. He had tears. And it doesn't say that he took his sweat or his tears and used them for anything. It's just mentioned that when he saw how Jerusalem rejected him, and when he saw how the people didn't believe that Lazarus could be raised from the dead, and he saw how they were weeping and wailing, it moved him and it says, Jesus wept. So a tear or more comes from the Lord for us, for us being caught up in nets of falsity and, and not being able to believe that Jesus Christ is our God. And so here it says the Lord took spit and put it upon the eyes of this blind man. In another version, there's a couple different versions of this, but in another place it says the Lord spit upon the ground and mixed it and made clay and then put it upon somebody's eyes to heal them. 
the devil came to tempt the Lord. And the devil told the Lord, this is in an earlier version, very early, uh, uh, earlier part of the Lord's life, ministry. And the devil said, turn those stones into bread. Because he was really hungry, 40 days in the wilderness, starving. And what did the Lord say? He quoted scripture and he said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. All that the Lord has spoken, every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord, it's not about turning things and doing miracles, but the bread of heaven is all the words of the Lord. What comes from the mouth of the Lord. The mouth of the Lord gives, obviously, the truth, but in this case, the mouth of the Lord healed blindness. How often do you use saliva? I'm going to turn a page in a book, right? Uh, we're very careful about it now, and we've always tried to be as we've grown up and learned that saliva does carry germs. So, but, you know, if you're in your own household, or you're, you might turn a page with your moisture from your, your, your mouth. Or if you have a little kid, or a big kid, and uh, they get a little pen on their hand or something, you might go like that, right? Right? No? Yes. Well, what if you want to heal a man of blindness and you're Jesus? He took that moisture. I, I was thinking about what sort of analogy we could use. If you've ever been stung by a bee, perhaps you know you can take a little bit of baking soda and you can mix it up with some water. There's all kinds of salves, right? All kinds of potions and things that you can mix together that will help heal you. So this is all you need to know about bee stings. If you get a bee sting, all you've got to do is this. No, it's not all you need to know. It's just one thing that you could do. You could put some of the baking soda on your bee sting, and it'll help it. Have any of you tried that? Okay, I got one, one taker here. Two, okay, three. <laughs> all right. I'd like to know that you're... You're out there and you're listening. That's not the only thing you can do for a bee sting. There's lots of things you can do for it. When the Lord was speaking with his disciples, and when he was healing, and we, he didn't do just this one thing. He didn't just spit in people's eyes to heal them from their blindness. He sent them in to do a lot of different, a variety of different things. And that's why I'm taking this idea that we can be easily snagged. Bethesda was, a, Bethesda was a place where they were easily snagged, easily hooked by the, the, this or that. Like when we see what you need to know, all you need to know about such and such, and you click on it. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. That clickbait is that kind of thing in our modern world that we just need to be, be aware of. So he healed this blind man's sight with his saliva. In another story or another version of this story, he mixed it with dirt. He, he made a salve and he put it on his eyes. <clears throat> and it was all over with, right? The man could see and he was ready to run home. Well, if you're listening to the story, you know, when he, when he did the first part of this miracle, he said, what do you see? I see men that look like trees walking. Wow. How many of you have issues with your eyesight? Some of us are wearing glasses, so you got a little bit of an issue. Some of us might have had surgery to repair that, or some of us might be wearing contacts. Some of us might have really good 20-20 vision, can see everything really well without any help. Or we might be as blind as a bat without our glasses or without some sort of aid to help us see. So this first installment of the Lord's miracle, it helped. He could see something better than nothing. Trees represent perceptions, general perceptions. The tree in the Garden of Eden, perception, the tree of life. It's, it's that idea that life comes from the Lord. I can see trees walking like men. And then he did it again, put his hands on his eyes. He said, look up, what do you see? I can see clearly now. 
the Lord doesn't give us this one thing this, that we're going to be cured of. All of a sudden, everything's going to be all right. Just follow one idea. You know, as life goes on, we, we have initial perceptions, and then we have better perceptions, and then we have a, a conviction that something's right. It takes a while to move through the stages of the Lord giving us vision. So he heals the blind man, but not just... Listen to the word of the Lord, what comes from the mouth of the Lord. It will help you see better. Continue to listening. To listen, and continue to look up. That's an important part in this, in this story. He said, look up. What snags us oftentimes is by looking down, looking at the things in the world, listening to the things going on out there. Have we no... Perception, the Lord said, don't you understand? Do you not believe? How many fragments did you take up? You know, I'll take care of you, but look up. So he said to the disciples earlier, I'm going to take care of you. It's not about your natural bread. And he said to this blind man, I've taken care of you. Look up and don't go back into that place where you're just going to get re-snagged. Don't go back into town. Go home. Now, we don't know where his home was, but it wasn't in that town. Or he would have said, go home to the town. Go home. Someday, the Lord might enlighten at least me to know why he was telling people at various times, don't tell anyone. Because at other times, he says, tell everybody. The shepherds went and told the whole world. And finally, in this story, we come to the big snag in this story. A couple different snags. The Pharisees, the leaven of the Pharisees, the blindness of Bethsaida. But then the Lord asking the disciples, so who do you say, or who do people say that I am? So he's getting them to think about what they've heard. And your pastor wants to get you to think about what you're hearing. The way you learn is to think about what it is you're taking in, what it is that's making a difference in your life, what it is that's influencing you, where are you getting snagged? Who do people say that I am? Jesus said. You can ask that question. We have to ask that question about everything in our lives. What do you think is the most important thing for me to do right now if I'm going to follow the Lord? We need to ask ourselves. What's going on out there? Who's the Lord in my life right now? What's going on right now? And where's the Lord? Look up. Where's the Lord? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. Look up. Where is the Lord? How is the Lord in your life right now? So the disciples well, some say you're John the Baptist. Come back from the, you know, from come back from the dead. John the Baptist was a little bit older than Jesus and had only recently been crucified. What kind of an answer is that? I don't know. Well, obviously he's not John the Baptist. John the Baptist and he John, they were together. How could he be John the Baptist? It it, it like, well, that doesn't make any sense. And yet it came out of the mouth of this man who'd been following the Lord for the last year, several years. Well, the better, better answer would say, well, some say you're Elijah. Okay, at least Elijah was centuries before, and so if you're going to believe in reincarnation or you know, the, re, you know, the coming down from heaven, Elijah went up into heaven, etc., etc. So maybe he came back down again in chariots of fire, Okay, And then what I'm kind of gave a generic answer. Well, you're, you're one of the other, you know, you're just one of the prophets. So in life, when we're challenged and we're asked to look around and, you know, see what people are saying, we, you know, people are telling us what's going on. In our spiritual lives, we must do the same thing. Jesus will ask us, the Lord asks us, who am I in your life right now? What are other people saying about the life you're living? 
to follow me? Are you following John the Baptist? Are you following Elijah? Are you following one of the pro- Are you following Jesus? Are you following the Lord? How the Lord has appeared to you and how the Lord talks to you in his word. And it's interesting how the Lord often phrases things very carefully, obviously, it's the word. Who do they say I am? Yahweh. That's what they say. And you're repeating to me what you've heard them say, the Lord says. But what do you say? What do you say? We're snagged, we're influenced, we're, we have so many things that influence the way we think and it affects how we relate to the Lord, how we relate to the world. The Lord asks us, what do people say? What's going on in your head about who I am? And then the Lord asks us to concentrate. So he focuses it on them. What do you say? Your people. What do all those other people out there say? Okay, John the Baptist, Elijah, some prophet. But now let's focus it in on what do you say? What's going on in your mind, in your heart about the Lord? And Peter answers, you are the Christ. In another version, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Yes, Peter. And I give to you the keys of heaven and hell and the world shall not prevail against it. And what you bind will be bound in heaven and what you loose will be loosed. In. So here's the power. This is as close as we get to here's all you need to know in this story. There's Jesus saying, yes, Peter, you've said the truth. When you know the truth and the truth speaks to you and you repeat it and you get affirmation from the Lord, your conscience, your perceptions, your understanding, your beliefs, you reject the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, you leave the net city, the city of confusion, and you're outside and you're in this state represented by this final part of this chapter. And you confess that I just need to be following the Lord, my one God. And upon this rock, upon this rock, will the church be built. There isn't just one thing we need to know. When you see that little thing it wants you to click on, well, all you need to know about the whatever, they're fishing. They're trying to snag you. They're trying to get you interneted. And I'm not just bashing on media again. It, it's, it's seen throughout the word. Here, it's seen right here. What do people say? What do people say? What's going on out there? What's going on in here? That's what the Lord brought his disciples back down to. Look up, look, look for perception and light. And then what's going on in here with you and the Lord? Do you have that solid rock of truth? That foundational belief that Jesus Christ is the one God of heaven and earth. The final lesson that I, le- I read from uh, the, the word talks about how that truth gets completely messed up through the centuries. And so Peter uh, becomes the main you know, disciple and everybody follows him and, and then people after him start taking his authority and you know, they rebuild a whole house of the Pharisees and house of, of Herod as it were the papal dominion dominion that came later and continued to develop, is the Babylonian Empire. And it says Swedenborg went and spoke with them and read them that, and they said, yeah, that's us. We're we're the ones in charge. We got given the keys, and we're in charge of everything. Salvation. You want salvation? Come to us. You want whatever you, you need? We'll give it to you. And so... The Lord, in his second coming, has given us the real keys to understand this. The truth of the second coming. The understanding that there is an interior sense to the word. That all things on the lower levels of the scriptures, of what's going on in the world, need to be viewed from a higher sense. Look up. And the light that is up will come down and enlighten us. And so he informs them, no, you're not. 
you're not Peter, and the rock is not you, and you don't have all this power. And similar to an earlier story I preached about where the word is given to people in the other world, um, they get a copy of the word in, in heaven, and they look up the passage. We're going to inquire. And they look it up, and wait, Peter's not even mentioned in here, because natural people and places and things in the word in the other world are replaced by the spiritual entities, the ideas. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Believe that. Rise up, lift up above personality and natural things and recognize the Lord has all power in heaven and on earth. And we can identify with the indignation and the anger mentioned in that last, that last lesson. We get an idea about what's right and what we are pretty much convinced of and it's pretty darn hard to tell us that we're wrong and if it's really true, we don't mind being questioned. But when we're kind of caught up in a net, don't bother me with the truth. I like the comfort of the system of thinking I have. We all have to recognize when we're that person. All those stories in the Word are about us. We can be the disciple listening to the Lord. We can be Peter confessing the Lord. We need to have the Lord in us telling us, this is what you need to know. I am Jehovah. I am the one God. The Father and I are one. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is the law and the prophets. Amen.